Okay, so let's talk about what consideration actually is. Um, now that we've got some of these high-level ideas out of the way, um, and I don't expect that you really will get this straight away. It is, again, it's like looking at the top of the jigsaw puzzle box and then we'll, we'll um, morph into the, into the terms as we move and, and get more precision as we understand more. So consideration is an element of an exchange that leads to a contract being enforceable. Consideration is generally defined in law as something of value given in exchange for a promise. It's regarded as the agreed price for the promise. Terminology here is important. It needs to be agreed. So it needs to be part of the bargain. It's not enough that it's just an exchange. It needs to be part of the bargain. So there are two aspects of this definition. The benefit detriment requirement which I think is easier to understand, and then the bargain requirement. The benefit or the detriment is need to be needed to be given in return for the promise in order for it to be legally sufficient consideration. So again, at risk of vastly oversimplifying, in order to get to um, consideration, we need the benefit detriment. So um, in fact, Rather than a plus sign here, this could be either. The offeree gives something up. The offeror gets something that is in fact agreed to as part of the exchange. And that gets us consideration. So a bargain here, I'm not talking about bargaining as in negotiating. I am also not using it in the terms of cheap. What I mean here is bargain as in agreement. So bargain as in reaching agreement. A promise or performance which is sought by the promisor and given by the promisee in exchange for a promise or for the performance, the original offer. Now it's confusing using this promise or promisee language but when you think about it in a bilateral contract we have both parties are promisors, each of them must promise something and each are promisees, each has the benefit of a promise that has been made by the other. So the promises induce each other. I will pay you $10 if you mow the grass. I will mow the grass if you pay me $10. So the consideration, which moves both ways, is the price for the promise made. When do you need it? You need it if you want your agreement to be enforceable. There's nothing to stop you promising things willy-nilly and not requiring anything in exchange um, and still following through on those promises. Just makes you a nice person but very, very difficult to sue unless, of course, you, there's a deed um, and unless, of course, you do it in a way to trick people which ends up with an estoppel but that's for another day. Um, for a promise to become legally binding, the promisee must give consideration to the promisor in exchange for the promise. When a contract made by an exchange of promises, um, when a contract is made, I should say, by an exchange of promises, each party's promise is consideration for the other party's promise. And an agreement that doesn't have consideration, has it has its own Latin name, kind of fun one to say, nudum pactum, a naked agreement, and it's generally unenforceable. Of course, if it's made on a deed, it will be, etc. There are two exceptions to the rule that a contract is not binding, and we've spoken about these, promissory estoppel and contracts under, uh, under seal. So unless anybody has a question about either of those now, um, I'm going to move on, but we will come back to it at the end when it all fits together. So, statement, and I'm pretty sure this is just a smaller version of the quote that we had earlier, valuable consideration in the sense of the law may consist of some right, interest, profit or benefit accruing to one party or some forbearance, detriment, loss or responsibility given, suffered or undertaken by the other. It comes from the decision of Justice Lush in the 1875 case of Curry and Mesa. So, it effectively requires a promisee to be worse off but this isn't always the case. And clearly those of you who have been um, concerned about this idea of a peppercorn rent or consideration that 
for you know a dollar is sufficient or an ice cream might be sufficient even though it's not adequate to pay for a car so the idea is though in exchange for the benefit of the promise that you've made to me I'm going to suffer some detriment by making a promise to you and that detriment might be to give something up or it might be uh, to put up with something in some way. The other important element here is consideration must move from the promisee. So if you and I are entering into a contract together, uh, you have promised to cut my lawn, then the consideration for your promise to become enforceable needs to come from the promisee the person to whom you made the promise. Um, so if I want my lawn cut and RMIT says we will pay students who come and cut the grass of lecturers who are working from home, um, in order for that promise to be enforceable, the promise that RMIT has made, um, that you can only sue them for that. You can't sue me, even though you might have cut my lawn. We will talk about this significantly more when we get to privity in particular. Leading case here is Dunlop and Pneumatic Tire Company and Selfridge. Um, actually, that's a better example. Let me just bring up my notes here so I make sure I tell you the right thing about about that case and oh, now I've got all oh, I can see all of you and I can't see my notes um, have a look at Dunlop, Dunlop Pneumatic Tire Company my memory is that the the reason we use that example is that the promises that were made by a manufacturer um, as opposed to the person from whom tires were actually purchased um, and in order for a promise to be enforceable, it needs to be made by the promisee. So the benefit, there needed to be a flow in the benefit. Now, clearly we have legislation, in particular the Australian Consumer Law, that deals with that particular circumstance now. And when manufacturers make promises, even though we don't contract with them uh, directly, uh, they can be held to those promises. The key case here, I think I mentioned Woolen Walls Mills before. We spoke about it briefly last week. Um, it's a confusing case and often people find it quite stressful. Um, and it is, if you're finding it stressful, it's worth reading the whole thing. Um, basically, this is a case where the Commonwealth, Commonwealth Government announced a subsidy so that it would support the price of wool. So this is sort of following out of you know, Menzies, who was one of Australia's longest serving prime ministers, um, believed that the way that, um, and his government believed that the way that Australia would come out of uh, or succeed following the Second World War is the expression was they would ride or we would ride on the sheep's back, that we would become a global producer of wool. And... So lots of people, there were lots of support structures in place uh, to benefit the growing of wool, um, but also there was, it was basically one of the first cartels. Uh, the Commonwealth itself organised the uh, collection and storage of wool so it could effectively um, uh, control supply and keep the price up. So another thing that it did was it would pay this subsidy to people, Australian manufacturers, who produced or purchased Australian wool to produce it in local factories. And so Woolen Mills, it was a woolen mill, so that's what it did. It bought wool and part of its budgeting was in reliance of the promise that it would get this subsidy, that it would basically get a rebate for the amount of wool that it purchased. Along the way, the Commonwealth Government said, we're not going to pay any more subsidies. In fact, Woolen Mills paid part of the subsidy back um, and then said, oh, no, hang on a minute. Um, 
that was a contractual promise that you made to us that your policy that's we acted in reliance on it and so you owe us this money and it wanted to recover the amount that had been paid and some of the outstanding subsidies the amounts that it would have got if the promise hadn't been withdrawn so this went to the high court and the court held that between the commonwealth's announcement so the promise or the offer and wool and mills purchasing the wool which it is saying was its executed consideration for the promise, there needed to be a quid pro quo, a this for that. There needs to be a connection between the act done in reliance on the promise and a bargain for that promise. So here the court said there was nothing that Commonwealth said which suggested that payment of the subsidy was promised in return for purchasing the wool. So the act of purchasing the wool the announcement was simply a policy. So there was no consideration. There needs to be a quid pro quo, an exchange of one thing, an act, for another thing, a promise that is made. This also comes out in a bit more detail in Beaton and McDivitt, which is a 1987 case. I quite like this case. It just amuses me for some reason. It's possibly the only thing you're ever going to read where there is a falling out over Tai Chi. Um, but there you have it. So um, McDivitt uh, lived, oh, McDivitt had um, some land uh, which was going to be rezoned at some future time, but at the time couldn't be subdivided. Um, so he suggested that um, Beaton come and live on the land and to uh, farm it in a particular way using permaculture methods. And so Beaton came and lived and worked on the land for more than seven years. And ultimately this Tai Chi dispute led to a claim for the transfer of the land under contract. So Beaton was saying, I did all of the things that you asked me to do. Um, I don't want to have to deal with you anymore. You promised me that land, transfer it to me. But the majority of the New South Wales Court of Appeal held that Beaton had no right to the transfer of the land. It's worth looking at the three judge, judgments, um, uh, President Kirby, as he was at the time, McHugh and Marnie, um, because they all of them look at this, this same point the same way, that reliance on the promise wasn't good enough consideration. There needs to be a bargain here. Unless an act is done in return for the promise, there is a remedy only in estoppel, not in contract. Um, because there was no promise of, that this particular work would be done in this particular way, there were a number of improvements. I think he actually even built a house on the land. Um, but because those things were done not in reliance of the promise that they could be transferred or that the land would be transferred, but afterwards, there was no contract. <laughs>